I am so excited to be here, and I'm really grateful for the attendance of my wonderful students and students I don't know yet, colleagues I do know, um, which are also included among the Venn diagram of former students, Professor Kirk Hawkins and Professor John Payne, and my other colleagues uh, around campus and in my own department. Thank you so much for coming to this unveiling. It has taken a long, long time to get to this point, and we are so thrilled. Uh, for the coming of this day. Before I go any further, I have to uh, echo the thanks uh, that um, Professor Bell of Spanville has given for all of those who had the vision to see what we saw and were willing to contribute materially to that effort. In particular, I want to introduce our current team of student coders who have made all of this possible. I've asked them to state their name, their major, uh, where they're from, and if you want to say how long you've been with the project, that would be cool too. We'll start over here with our oldest coder. Uh, my name is Pat Sturmer. I'm currently in uh, the Sociology uh, Graduate Program. I've been with the project since its inception uh, about six years ago. Great. Carl Brinson. I've been with the project for about a year, and I'm an Asian Studies and Economics major. Thank you. These are some of the finest minds on campus, and I'm honored to work with them. All right, let's go ahead and get started. We want to introduce you to the Women's Stats Database. Um, it has become almost conventional now to echo with former Secretary General Kofi Annan that the situation of women actually matters to world affairs, international affairs. Uh, the world is starting to grasp there's no policy more effective in promoting development, health, and education than the empowerment of women and girls. But he goes further, and I would venture that no policy is more important in preventing conflict or in achieving reconciliation after a conflict has ended. However, there's a big obstacle, and the big obstacle is, and th these are all quotes from the United Nations in the last year, we have an urgent need for a knowledge base. We need a comprehensive set of international indicators. We need more and better quality data. And that's where we come in. Go ahead, Matt. Um, if any of you who have attempted to research the situation of women, especially cross-nationally, you will find yourself up against some pretty stiff challenges, missing and obscure data. What we found is, is uh, sometimes statistics are not disaggregated by gender. Finding suicide rates disaggregated by gender can be a real challenge. Finding caloric intake disaggregated by, date of, by gender can be a real challenge. Some variables are simply not collected at all because states do not believe that these are even variables or even phenomena. For example, we have quite a, a large subset of states that do not recognize marital rape as a phenomena, but rather as an oxymoron, and so do not collect data on it. Uh, we have other nations where just no data is available at all. Somalia? <laughs> Issues concerning standardization and comparability. In some countries, you're considered literate if you can sign your name. In other countries, you're considered literate if you've completed three to five years of primary education. So there's differences in how these variables are defined. The reports are in many different languages. The most interesting reports may be in the most exotic languages. Some information is widely known to country experts, but has never actually made its way into print or been officially noted by the state. 
Uh, there are other existing um, indicators and databases uh, on women, but they tend to be rather narrowly focused. Uh, GEM and GDI, the most common indicators used, the Gender Empowerment Measure, the Gender Development Index, a total of a half dozen variables between the two of them. Uh, WISTAT, the UN's collection of statistics on women, 76 variables. Gender stats offered by the World Bank, 21 variables. But uh, we decided to take these challenges on. Uh, the origins are uh, back in 2001, um, after I'd been thinking a lot about the relationship between the situation of women and the security of states with reference to the abnormal sex ratios of Asia, I began to ask myself, is this a broader phenomenon? Can we see broader linkages, aside from simply looking at sex ratios, linking these two um, uh, levels of analysis? Um, but I quickly discovered that the type of data that I needed to pursue this research agenda simply did not exist. And so, in typical fashion, I decided to just create it. <laughs> that wasn't going to stop me. Uh, so in 2001, we started, and we were looking only at 27 variables. Now we have 245 variables for 172 countries. This data is continually updated, right? Yes, my coders are nodding. <laughs> in two days. 363 data points have been added to our database. Bless you all. Uh, the database now contains over 61,000 data points. Now, let's go to that. Uh, yeah, um, I want to tell you a little bit about why our database is somewhat unique. WISTAT and uh, gender stats are going to give you um, particular statistics, numbers, prevalences of this or that or the other thing. Um, however, we believe that that's not good enough to understand the nuances of the situation of women worldwide. So for example, let's take non-marital rape. We collect 10 different variables on non-marital rape. And they are concerning practice and custom, laws, and of course, the typical statistics, data that you would get from other sources. So for example, under practice, we want to know if laws on rape are even enforced. Can the police prosecute without the victim's testimony? Are there taboos or barriers or sanctions against reporting rape? Is rape grounds for a husband to divorce his wife? Is rape grounds for murder or assault of the rape victim? Are there societal sources of support for victims, such as hotlines and shelters? And then we also collect qualitative uh, experiences of rape uh, in testimony that women have given to human rights organizations. Law. Are there laws against rape? There, there are still a handful of countries in which it is almost impossible to define rape legally. Uh, and how is rape defined? What are the punishments? How is rape proven? Who can be a legal witness? In some cultures, there must be several male witnesses for rape to be proven. Data, and then here, those typical types of things, incidents of rape, incidents of conviction, incarceration, estimate of what percentage of rapes are in fact reported. So if you want rape, boy, do we have rape for you. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that sounded really bad, didn't it? <laughs> okay, go ahead to the next one, Matt. Um, the best part of it all is it's a centralized knowledge base. Uh, we've got 245 variables. You want to know something about women in Burkina Faso, our database is your first stop. All right, we may not have it all, but we're going to have as much of it as is out there in print. Go ahead. Obscure data, we've coded over a thousand different sources, more are coded every day. About 10 new sources are coded every day. We triangulate source material, so we don't just rely on particular sources, but we take sources uh, that may express a range of opinions. Wonderfully, we're at BYU, and so I can actually have my coders translate reports into a variety, from a variety of different languages. French, Spanish, Albanian, Arabic, Portuguese, Indonesian, Russian, and Chinese to date. Um, our data collection effort is also very useful. The UN, when we presented this information to the UN, they were actually most impressed by our ability to point out what data was not being collected on women so that they could approach the national statistical bureaus of the various countries and say, hey, guys, you're not collecting this variable. We would like to see it. 
ease of access and use, uh, we have worked very hard over the last several months with a computer programmer to make this an online interactive resource for you with full bibliographic uh, references for every single piece of information. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> And we've also created an ability for credentialed users that have been approved by our project to contribute data directly. As long as you have an internet connection and you're credentialed and we approve you, I don't care if you're in an internet cafe in Nepal, we can accept your data and load it directly into our database. And lastly, we feel that the, the organization that we've created as far as the code book, the variables, how they're defined and so forth, um, actually provide a needed template that can start to move towards standardization for data coverage and reporting. We'd like to take you to the database where we'll show you how to view data, download it, contribute it, access various reports, and of course you can do this on your own computer as soon as you leave this uh, meeting. Go ahead, Matt. All right, show them the, the home page first. All right. Yeah, move it over a little. This is our homepage, womanstats.org, okay? And we'll simply uh, sh uh, point out a few things, but then we want to show you actually how to use the thing. Over on the left menu here, um, we have uh, a short written tutorial on how to use the site. Use the site is up there, Matt. Yeah. And then we have uh, an overview, a written overview of the project. Matt has created animated tutorials to help you figure out how to use this database. Our code book, we'll be uh, accessing that in a moment. Data entry facility, maps, which uh, Professor Chad Emmett of the Geography Department has helped us create. We'll show you those in a moment. Our research link will give you links to our papers and articles that are already forthcoming from our data collection effort bios of the board of directors, a full list of all student coders who've ever worked for our project, very impressive, and of course contact information. All right, Matt, then, so let's suppose that you've logged on, you want to enter the database, okay? You hit the link, enter the database. After uh, going through a few screens, you will ta be taken to what we call our view screen, okay? And uh, this is going to allow you to pull up our data right there on your desktop, or at least a slice of it. There are several parameters that you can choose from. You can choose to look at all of the data, which is the default, data before 2000, data after 2000, data from 2005 to the present. You can have the uh, program sort the data from newest to oldest or oldest to newest, depending upon your research questions. We um, have typified our sources, that is, we say what kind of sources we have used for particular data points. You can pick one or more or all, you can pick several, default is all, and then uh, some folks are interested only in what might be called hard data, some are interested in qualitative or interpretive data. You can choose to see all data or only a particular kind of data. Uh, you are allowed to choose on screen up to five countries and up to five variables to see on your desktop. Matt, why don't you go ahead and choose us our uh, three, uh, we're going to, um, oh, I, yes, that's right, choose our countries and then we'll go to the code book. We're going to do Afghanistan, Burkina Faso, and Guatemala. Now, you need to select some of our 245 variables and as you can imagine, we needed to create abbreviations that would allow you to easily recognize a variable and choose it. So we're going to open our code book in a new window. Here's our code book and uh, scroll down. Each of those blue links is one of our variables, okay? And uh, as, you, as you scroll down, if you hit a variable like domestic violence, hit on it. Maybe you're interested in domestic violence. It takes you to that part of our code book that lists all of the variables that we have for domestic violence. You see there's two practice, three law, one data, and we've even done a scaling of domestic violence. Okay, go on back. Okay, um, there's also an acronym list. Let's suppose you're more familiar with the code book, but you're still like, what the heck is ERBG? You can pull up a little crib sheet that reminds you what each of the acronyms stand for in case you're just blanking on it. Close out of that, Matt. All right, Matt's going to pick a practice variable, a law variable, and a data variable for us. We're going to look at differential access to health care based on gender. 
practices. We're going to look at, uh, no, need the law on that one. We're going to look at rape laws. And we're also going to look at uh, average age of marriage, which is a data point, a statistical point. There we go. He's going to hit retrieve. And right over in the other room there, our server is going to pull up that data for you. Okay, there it is. Uh, you probably can't see it very well, but the full bibliographic citation, including URLs, paragraph numbers, dates, you name it, are provided for every single piece of data that you can see. You see the screen is turned a little bit uh, darker here, a little gray here. That's your next variable, rape laws. Sorry, the screen is such that we can't show you the full thing. Go ahead down to the next variable. And then we have age of marriage statistics right there, real time, within 10 seconds. You have that data right before you. Now, there are several uh, reports. Let's do the reports. There are several reports that you can look at to, um, it's over there, Matt. We're going to look at three different reports that you can access to help uh, make your search of the database more effective. Let's do the missing data report first. The missing data report will tell you, for a country, what variables we're missing, have no data on at all. Or for a variable, what country we are missing. That is, we have no information for a particular country. Matt's going to choose a variable here. I think it was practice one. There you go. He's going to run the report. On uh, employment restrictions based on gender, we have no data for Bhutan, Brunei, the Comoros, Djibouti, East Timor, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Somalia, Taiwan, and Trinidad, Tobago. But that's it. You can expect to find data on this for every other country in our database. Well, now we're going to run a bibliographies report. Suppose you're interested in, uh, let's hit the bibliographies report. Suppose you're interested in knowing what sources we've already looked at in coding either a country or a variable. We're just going to pick Bangladesh here, going to run the report, and what will pull up is the bibliographic citation for every single piece of data that we have gotten from Bangladesh. And you can see that we've coded quite a bunch of sources on Bangladesh. The database coverage report is uh, an overall report that will list every country and every variable and tell you what percentage data coverage we have. So this one takes a little longer because it's searching the whole database. So here's each country and it tells you percent complete. What percentage of the 245 variables do we have? So for instance, for Kenya, where's Kenya? Down for Kenya, we have 71% coverage on Kenya, which is, which is pretty good. Scrolling further down, you get the same information per variable. Okay, so for example, um, practice concerning rape, LRW practice one, we have 97% coverage. Of course, for some other data points, we have very little coverage. Um, and, but you can check that out. And then finally, at the very end, you can see how many data points are in the entire database, 61,381 today. Okay. Now, you're not just stuck with viewing the data. You can also download the data. Matt, you want to take us to that screen? Okay. Let's suppose you want to see and save more than five countries or five variables or whatever. Um, we will allow you to export to your desktop a CSV file, which is openable in, in Excel, which will have all the data, and of course you can choose several of the parameters, like years and so forth, all the data we have either for one country or for one variable. So if you want all our data on Bangladesh, you can download all our data on Bangladesh in one CSV file. You want all the data we have on infibulation practices worldwide, you can download all the data on infibulation. And it will contain still the full bibliographic reference for you uh, that you can use. Okay, Matt, let's go back to the PowerPoint. All right, go to the next page. All right, who could use women's stats? Well, you can imagine we've thought big about this. <laughs> Policymakers, right? they're always decrying the fact that they don't have enough data to make good policy. Well, they don't have that excuse anymore. Researchers, okay, I've been using it a ton. Journalists, we've had journalistic inquiries. 
uh, all sorts of organizations, teachers, students, you. Okay? Go ahead, Matt. Now, how about our own research agenda? You remember that I was originally interested in the state of women as versus uh, the security and stability of nation states. That's what I was doing. Now that we have our database fully accessible, we've been able to march forward like gangbusters and with new findings that no one has ever been able to, um, to create before. So what is the relationship? Here's the current questions we're investigating. Are states with high levels of violence against women more likely to behave violently in the international system? Are states which do not enforce their own laws protecting women more likely to be non-compliant with international laws and agreements? Do states with prevalent polygamy have higher rates of violence against women? Which factors are better predictors of the rogueness of a state? Democracy, wealth, Islam, or the security of women? Do states treat their women better because they're more democratic, or are they more likely to be democratic because they treat their women better? Likewise, do states treat their women better because they're wealthier, or are they more likely to be wealthy because they treat their women better? We can start to ask and answer these questions. And we do so through a theoretical framework. We've taken our 245 variables, we've clustered them under conceptual um, uh, clusters such as physical security, economic security, legal security, and so forth. And then we're then able to take our nuanced data and create some multivariate scales. We currently have scales on degree of violence against women, trafficking, sun preference, polygyny, discrepancy between law and practice concerning women, among others. Um, we're getting inequity in family law, right, Amalia? Yeah, this week, right, Amalia? Yeah, good. <laughs> Because ours is an interdisciplinary research effort, we've been able to call upon the resources of the geography department to help us now visualize the kinds of things we're finding in our data. Let's go ahead to the map page. Okay, can you pull that over so we can get it centered a little bit? Okay. All right, so here we have some wonderful uh, uh, visualizations of the differences in women's physical security across the world. Go ahead, Matt. Trafficking of females, how good, how bad. Sun preference and sex ratios, look how China and India and Vietnam and South Korea pop out there. Keep going. Discrepancy, how discrepant is a nation between the laws it has on the books protecting women and how they're enforced. Go ahead. And our latest map is prevalence of polygyny across the world, a map that's never been produced before because the scale never existed before the Women's Stats database went online. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. What we're discovering, I have some fun initial findings to share with you. Go ahead, Matt. We have already found a statistically significant relationship between how a state enforces its own laws concerning women and how peaceful and compliant the nation is internationally. We've also found a higher R squared, which means a greater explanatory value for the above findings than the R squareds for measures of freedom, wealth, or Islamic culture. We have found a statistically significant relationship between the level of violence against women in society and the peacefulness of the state in the international system. We have also found a statistically significant relationship between the prevalence of polygyny in a society and its level of violence against women. Again, something that was pretty intuitive, but nobody could prove it before. We can prove it now. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, in sum, we think we've got something really special for you, important, um, that is going to change the way that we look at security, it's going to change the way that we look at the situation of women. For too long, women have been invisible, invisible in security studies, invisible in international relations, and oftentimes even invisible as concerns domestic public policy issues. No longer. Now you can show the link. And that link is, we believe the fate of the world's women depends on, uh, fate of the world depends on the fate of the world's women. And you can see that link now with our database. Thank you very much.
thank you. I want to add how proud I am that this database comes from Brigham Young University. How proud I am that we can offer this as a church-owned school to the women of the world. And I want to thank those at BYU who have paid the wages of my students to make this possible. All right, I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, anything that you'd like to talk about, anything you'd like to know more about, I'm here for you. And my coders are here for you. Yes. Um, marrying more than one woman at a time? Polyandry is marrying one, more than one man at a time, but you only find that in the highlands of Nepal and a few places in Bhutan. <laughs> yes. Oh, you bet. It actually doesn't come out too good. Um, that one's easy. Uh, in, in the field of international relations, um, we have multiple different measures to determine how peaceful a state is. The, the one that has the latest cachet is the Global Peace Index produced by the Economist Intelligence Unit, and you can find that online. But we have numerous others as well that we use in IR on a regular basis. But now I can, I can ask all sorts of new questions about those rankings. Yes? You just email me and we'll welcome you with open arms. Um, the best students on campus work for me. And I'd like to testify that some of those students have been through us in the lean times and have worked for free. And I'm so grateful to those of you who are willing to do that until we were able to get more funding. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes? Um, currently, internally, uh, we do have funding from some external sources. In Utah, the Sorensen Legacy Foundation, which is very visionary, has given us some money. Uh, Swanee Hunt has a, a foundation called Hunt Alternatives that has given us some money. Uh, an LDS woman based in Colorado has given us some money. But by and large, it's the David M. Kennedy Center for International and Area Studies. It's the Women's Research Institute. It's the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. It's the, the Marjorie Pay Hinckley Chair. It's the Mary Lou Fulton Chair. And those of you who are associated with those programs, I see some of you sitting in this room. Thank you for having faith in us. Sure, we're worried about future funding. I can't tell you how many times we've applied to the National Science Foundation. The latest rejection was great. Are you ready for this? It looks like they're going to be doing this anyway, whether we fund them or not. <laughs> was our latest rejection. So the next time, we're applying again in January to the NSF, and of course at that point we're going to be telling them that we're, going to, we're about to die if they don't come and rescue us. So <laughs> but it will come. It will come. It will come because this is needed and it is good. And so I have faith that doors will be open for us. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have we've kind of kept it under our hat until July. July, when our database went online, we started. We just began to start. It's been fascinating. I've attended two conferences since that time, and people have come up to me and they've said, "I've heard the rumors about this Woman Stats database. Is it for real? Does it really exist? What's the URL? How do I get in?" Um, we only went online at the very end of July, and we've already had 1,352 hits on the website. We haven't told anybody, really, about it yet. And we have over 100 active accounts from uh, folks in uh, intergovernmental organizations, such as the UN, non-governmental organizations, journalists, and scholars. Um, as soon as our first article is accepted, we will try to have a national press release um, that will bring this to the attention of far more people than we can do on our own. Yes? How current is your data? Oh. <laughs> Today? <laughs> Would you like to answer that, Patricia? Well, I saw the article from the New York Times, which is a Congress that's like every day. In fact, we ha probably have better data about today than we have about 1990. You know, we started in 2001, so we started with the most current sources and have tried to keep current. For example, we just did a round of coding the very latest CDAWs 
that were submitted to the CEDAW Commission at the UN. Uh, so we're, you know, we're right up there, what beginning 2000. Oh, the uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Carl has been, actually worked in Geneva this summer with women's organizations and found the Women's Stats database to be very helpful there also. But so if you're looking for data from 1990, we only do past data when we can. Uh, obviously, if the National Science Foundation would like to give us the money, we'd be delighted to go backwards. And we would be delighted not just um, because it's a good thing, but also because it allows us then to have longitudinal measures of the status of women, to show the change over time in their status. And we really want that data. Bingo. Exactly. Wonderful. Yes? You bet. So the actual Matt, why don't you take our first multivariate scale? Um, we're slowly come up with multivariate scales. We've only been scaling since July. But uh, let's take our first multivariate scale, which is, um, yeah, go to our view screen. Our multivariate scale is the physical security of women, a scaling of the degree of phys physical security women would enjoy in a particular country. Yeah, just pick a few countries there, Matt. I'm assuming we have data for those three, but I haven't checked. All right, let's see what we've got. All right, coming up is the number, all right? And we do periodic six-month coding, so you actually see we have two six. Uh, these are the same. It'll give you the scale point. You can look up the scale point on the, the code book the description. Now, you can also download these, and the number will appear in its own column in the spreadsheet. So you can immediately import it into your statistical programs and manipulate it in that way. Oh, yeah. Do you want to go to the code book and just show them the scale? We're so proud of our multivariate scales. They don't look like anything else that, in, that people have. Yeah, just the first one. Yeah. Okay, here's our multivariate scale on the physical security of women. It gives you the full coding rules. So we actually have had scholars from Brown University and Auburn University use our scaling to do further scaling, which is kind of fun. Um, and then, um, let's see, the, the variables that we examine include domestic violence, law one, practice one, and practice two, and data one. Laws on ra rape, law one, practice one, and practice two, and data one. Rape and sexual assault. I can't see where the rest of that goes. Marital rape, murder. That, you know, there's a whole cluster of variables that are factored into this particular multivariate scaling. Good luck to you. I hope you can use it. Some great master's theses can come out of this, right? Yeah. Um, it's not too bad on the situation of women, uh, but it's really bad on the indicators of peacefulness. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's almost an anomalous case. It's not as good as certain of the European countries. But feel free to go explore, go compare, have, have a ball. We have a ball. We just have so much fun searching. Of course, it's also, I want to tell you, it's also really gloomy. And I think my coders can attest to this, right? You read a few C